friends and them w ran away from Lodge into a small town near us. And the parents got killed and the two boys survived. So the whole bunch of us, we went to Poland. We met lots of people from Lodge, young boys and girls, and we became a family. All these kids that had nobody became a family. They were Polish people, Jewish boys, but they were from Poland. So they were, uh, you know, uh, I remember one of them said, oh, no, we're going to live in, my, in our house. So we went to his house, and sure enough, the apartment was there. It was in Lodge. And uh, we all bunked in. And I don't know where they went, and they got mattresses, and we put it on the floor, and we had... Yeah, yeah. The Russians took some of the younger people into the, to, to fight with them, which is it's normal. They needed them. There are, I don't blame the Russians for nothing. I, I, they didn't kill anybody. I don't blame them. It's the Ukrainians. They were all, all just like that. The war came to an end, and the war came to an end. There were lots of uh, people from Israel, young people, came to find out what they can do with this little bit that's left and get them to Israel. We called them shlichim. They had opened up a camp in a, in a kibbutz, guess where? In Germany, yeah, because the war was over. They came in, in, in illegally there, but they opened up a kibbutz, got that all together, and we became a kibbutz to get us to, into Israel. We walked, we wa you should see how far we walked from place, from border to border <laughs> once we came. I don't remember which country it was, but it was big hills. They transported us, but we still walked very high up. I know we went in trucks. As a matter of fact, one of the young boys uh, that came through the war, that from my town. Ephraim was his name. And he, uh, I remember being with him, hiding from country to country. There was a, a tra an old truck, and we had, I guess, four kids he had in there. And uh, he drove us um, from one border to the other, but in, we were in the back. But I don't know what he had, crates or whatever he had there. And he was so quiet, he couldn't breathe or anything, because they came to check. And when we came, the whole group, we came to the border, they arrested us. It was supposed to be paid off. So we, <laughs> there we are in jail. <laughs> oh, my God. And the next morning, early morning, the guy that got the money that he was paid off got there, opened up the doors, he said, go. <laughs> It threw us all out. They paid him. The Israeli person, the shaliach, had a deal with him, but not with the guy that was before him. So we, we came too early with the walking. So what I remember walking up high hills. I cannot, I don't know where it was.
I got as far as Italy. If it was in Cremona, Cremona, Italy, and uh, waiting to get to Israel. It was the Americans he, from here and the Canadians. Uh, there was barracks uh, from the uh, Italian uh, soldiers, and they gave it to the people that were on their way to Israel. They gave them that to stay there. It was fine. Everybody was uh, happy there. The Italians are very fine people. There's no other people like the Italians. They, they treated us not like refugees. Our boys and girls used to uh, go and play ball with them. They were very, very nice. And we had plenty of food. They were more hungry than us. It all came from the United States, but it came in cans, mostly canned foods. And powdered milk and things like that, yeah. I volunteered to everything. <laughs> and I was as clumsy as anything. I volunteered to learn how to sh uh, shoot, because to Israel, you have to learn how to shoot. It, Israel wasn't Israel. It was Palestine, and the, the Brits were there, and I, w I knew what was going on there. <laughs> you remember the, that old ship, the Exodus? My cousin was on that ship that uh, they sent back. And they said to them, you step one step up here, the Brits said, we'll throw you in the ocean. They sent them back with that old uh, boat. I didn't want to go to Israel. It was too much. I saw too much. I, I, I had to. Like if I had to, I'd have gone. But uh, it's not what I wanted. Then I get a letter from somebody from Canada that's supposedly my mom's an aunt. She knew somebody in that camp that somebody told her about the correspondence. So she wrote this personal letter saying, would you know of somebody by the name of Ethel Cott or a any from the Cots? So they told her, yes, there's a little girl. So. She wrote me a letter, and she said, uh, um, I found you, that you're there, and I'd like you to stay there. Don't go anywhere. Don't go to Israel, because I was ready for Israel. Don't go to Israel. Stay there. And my son is working on papers. And as soon as we get the papers, you'll come to Canada. You think I thought of Canada? <laughs> yeah, I, got, I never heard of Canada. <laughs> Anyhow, so I stayed there for, I don't remember how long, but I stayed there for quite a while. I said, I want to go to a country. I, I knew I went through too much. And I said, no, if I have a chance, I'll wait in this camp. And I waited uh, quite a while until my papers came through. I was very sick. <laughs> I was never on a, on a ship, <laughs> let alone an old boat. <laughs> I didn't go direct to Pembroke. I went to Montreal, and I found out that my, my mother has a brother in Montreal. I, went to, I stayed with my, uh, with my uncle and aunt in Montreal, not too long. What happened was afterwards, <laughs> and I also had this aunt from Pembroke that paid for everything. So when I came to Montreal, I didn't, I just couldn't make myself go to Pembroke to see them because I w my uncle had, uh, he used to, come at night from work. She, they lived in a small apartment, my aunt and uncle, and the two kids. And on the way back from work, he would bring two, in his both hands, sweets from Arena Bakery. <laughs> because we never had that. So every night he would come on his way from work, and all the kids would gather in their, in their apartment, and we would have a treat. Every night for a long time, yeah. And I didn't want to go to Pembroke. 
And my aunt from Pembroke kept calling him and saying, really, she, I want to see her. I, I can't, can you not send her here with Dorothy? He said, she doesn't want to go. She just wanted those kids, those young people. And uh, finally, she, uh, my cousin said to me, her daughter, ah, Ethel, I'm going to take you to, and then I'll go back because I've got to go to school. And uh, I couldn't speak any e English, not a word. So we went, the two of us went to Pen Pembroke. Dorothy went back to Montreal to go to school. And my aunt and uncle wanted me to stay there for a while. Oh, my God. I was awful. <laughs> I said, I can't. I got to go back to Montreal. I can't stay here. I, I'm too lonesome. They were too old folks. And uh, I we did a lot of crying. So my aunt was very kind to my mother's aunt, actually. She, was, uh, she had a very uh, kind attitude. So she says, oh, I'm taking her back to Montreal. Oh, I'm taking her back to Montreal because she's going to get sick here with us. So I said, OK. So the two of us went to Montreal. I was 15 then. We were leaving to Montreal. And so she says to me, the train doesn't go direct to Montreal. It stops in Ottawa, and it takes three hours, and then we get another train. I said, OK, what's the difference? So, but she says, don't worry. We're, we're not going to sit on the train for three hours and wait for them to, you know, to go to Montreal. I have a very good friend, and she's going to, she'll send somebody to pick, pick us up from the train. OK. So somebody came, a guy a son, and he pick, picked us up and brought us to the, uh, to the airplane. And we had coffee, and then we went back to Montreal. Well, all of a sudden, a while, little while after, I get, I get from my uncle that was living in Montreal, Uncle Willie. And he says to me, uh, Ethel, you know the guy that picked you up? He wants to come see you. <laughs> His name is Sid <laughs> Kersner. <laughs> so that's how I met my husband. But I had a deal with Sid. The deal was never ask me questions. And he just couldn't. He did not. He, f he, he, talked, he talked to other people. He knew. Because through my cousin from Israel, he knew. But not for me. I couldn't handle it. It was just painful to say. It's very painful. It takes a lot out of you. And you just not ready for that. You have to be ready. I think you're the first one that asked me. You have to know you have a past. You can't look forward if you don't have a past. So, um, Enjoy life while you can. Be good to each other, and life will be good to you. Because life is short. You don't know what tomorrow brings. And that's, that's what it is. You have to take what's given to you. It's a hand that's given to you, and that's what they that's what you have to deal with. And you deal. Dealt with it for so many years? No. I told you everything I know.